Alright, now we're going live. So now we're going live again. That's the problem with going live, and one of the reasons why I kind of avoid it sometimes is because internet connection can go in and out. So it can cause issues when I'm on the. What's it called right now? Cell phone. But hopefully, they can hear us discuss a little bit. If uh, they pop up any questions or anything, then I can see it. Hopefully. They didn't probably hear somebody, but there was going to be the one right behind us. That's so weird. I saw them just go through the, the cornfield. That's possible. Oh, they're mowing the bank. Yeah, let's see. Yes. Yeah, young people that do. Huh? Chapter 4. Oops. Of course I hit my camera. We have Kayla on. Hey Kayla. <laughs> Hi Kayla. I don't know if you can hear everybody says hey. Yeah, chapter 4, 31 through 37. Oh, give everybody time to show up. Get ready, all that good stuff. Allison has the puppy. Here's a beautiful lawnmower behind us. Always. Father God, we give you thanks and praise for this beautiful day, the opportunity to come outside in your creation, discuss your word, and enjoy the fellowship that we do have here on site, and also anyone that shows up online. And as always, we just pray that you are honored and glorified by all that is said and done here today. For it is in Christ's name we pray, amen. So, last week, I don't know if either one of you watched the sermon yet. I did. Okay. Uh, last week we finished with Jesus being in the synagogue of Nazareth and proclaiming himself as the Messiah through Isaiah's words. And it's like everybody was happy at first and then when he tells them that, you know, he believes they want to see him do the same miracles and things that they'd heard him do at Capernaum, then that was whenever they were upset because they believed that he should start out in his hometown with his own people and that they should be able to see the same things that Capernaum saw. And so because he wasn't going to do anything, of course, they decide to try to throw him off a cliff, throw him out of town, all that good stuff and run him out. Unhappy because he's not going to do any miracles or things at their beck and call is kind of the way I look at it. And a lot of times we in the church or, or we ourselves look at, you know, we need to be doing things for our own people, start with our own people first and, and, and so on, where I think we, and what Christ was saying to the to his home people, and looking at Isaiah and Elijah was, 
Isaiah and Elijah, or excuse me, Elijah and Elisha both ministered to Gentile people. They did the miracles for the Gentiles instead of the Israelites. And so basically he's saying he was going to kind of do the same thing. Now granted he came to the Jews to begin with, but his word, his grace, his salvation is for all people. And he wasn't going to be limited to just his hometown or just the Jews. So that's the what we had talked about before. And then as I keep trying to, to do, try to find everything within order as far as Christ's words and Christ's works. But when you're going back and forth between all four Gospels, it's kind of hard to piece everything because each person has their own perspective and they're all telling from memory as they write these things down. It wasn't like they were going around doing the stuff with Christ and writing it at that moment. They're all telling from memory and so some things, some have in different orders versus other ones. But I found it interesting, you know, John actually says after the wedding, they went to Capernaum with his mother, with his disciples, and with his uh, brothers. I was saying a lot of times we only catch the brothers part of that. You know, that he had his brothers, you know. Uh, and Matthew says, that, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. And then Luke, who we had looked at last week, also tells of Jesus' adventures in Capernaum after he had been in Nazareth. So I kind of felt like maybe Luke was kind of, you know, he mentioned it in the story that we read last week where he was in the synagogue and where he was telling the people, y'all probably want, want to see me do the same things I did in Capernaum. Luke didn't tell that part before that section of scripture. He waited until after that section of scripture to tell what Christ had done in Capernaum. And that's where we'll pick up tonight, Luke chapter 4, verse 31 through 37. And as always, our goal with the red letters is to try to see what Jesus says about himself and what we can learn about him and what we can learn to apply to our own lives. Everybody has an idea of who and what Jesus was, whether we believe in him for salvation or not. The large majority of the world population believes he did live and the large majority knows that he was killed most people believe he did or he is known to have done miracles and so today we're going to kind of look at one of those miracles and again luke chapter 4 verse 31 to 37 then he went down to capernaum the city of galilee and he was teaching them on the sabbath and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you do to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. So as we've talked about before, and as we see Jesus as he moves and goes along throughout the land, he goes to the synagogue a lot of times on Sabbath, and he teaches, and he preaches. He teaches and preaches the same thing. And so, a little trivia tonight to begin with. What was the message that Jesus was most known for preaching and teaching? Helping your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Something he had said, yes. <laughs> what did he come to preach? Salvation, What did John preach? When Jesus was about to come, what was John's message? 
All right, Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Don't worry about turning to it, just a verse. The time is fulfilled, and this is Jesus' words. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Luke chapter 4, 43. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Matthew 4, 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the main message he was constantly known for as he went along in his travels. And we'll get into figuring out eventually what the kingdom of heaven is and what he was actually saying there, or what the kingdom of God was. But tonight, we're kind of looking at just what he's doing here in the, the Sabbath. So, yeah. So if we contrast this, tonight's story, with him healing the, the man of the demon possession, with his experience in Nazareth and at the synagogue, what is the difference in the response between the two? Between like the, the synagogue people and the demons? The Nazarene and the and the uh, Capernaum synagogue. Now, where is that? So remember what they wanted in Nazareth. They wanted to see him do great deeds. They wanted to see him do miracles. They wanted to, I almost want to say, use him as their personal genie in a way. You know, show us what you can do, Jesus. Whereas here, the people looked at his teaching and they were amazed and they were filled with wonder and awe. And then you have the person... I like the idea of thinking about you know being in church and then somebody yelling out while everybody's quiet, listening to the sermon, and somebody screaming from the back row or something. You know, what kind of response is that gonna bring? These people's motives were better. Right. Well, these people's motives were definitely better. So they were astonished at his teaching for his word possessed authority. And so they were used to the scribes preaching. Or the, the rabbis teaching and a lot of that for one was filled with tradition a lot of it was just kind of going through the motions of sharing you know God's Word and sometimes we can all kind of be a little bit dry and repetitive uh, as well about it and they had Jesus here who really comes in and tells it as it is so the scribes, <clears throat> excuse me, the scribes were those that made copies of God's word, in case you didn't know. Hence, they may have read it, they may have recited it, but may not have had the conviction, belief, or passion in their teaching. And they definitely wouldn't have taught with power like Jesus would have. And if he remembers words to the Nazarenes, he taught that he was the Messiah, and yet, according to Jesus, they didn't care about his message as much as, as they cared about seeing what he could do for them. So do what we heard you did in Capernaum. And remember, we're actually looking at Capernaum now after we've already been to Nazareth, so we're kind of hindsight here. So here in Capernaum, it appears his message was received well. Do you think this may be why they saw greater things done in their location? I kind of thought about, you know, and I've said before, I think on last week's sermon, you're sort of a pastor's kid coming up. You know, you remember these people in Nazareth, they all knew Jesus when he grew up. They got to see him. And what is it like for that person that's been in that church all, the li all their life, or in the synagogue all their life, whatever, and then they get up and they preach the first time? You know, oh, yeah, you know, it's kind of, he's not quite the same when you go somewhere else and don't have that whole familiarity with the person. And so they weren't really interested in Nazareth about Jesus the person 
as much as what he could do now because they saw him grow up he didn't do much miracle wise as far as we know and so they weren't they just heard what he'd done and wanted him to do the same thing there i can't get past the contrast of jesus having to tell the religious leaders who he was and the demons I already, yeah, I already knew, yeah. And we're going to get to that. I was thinking about this, number one, the idea of faith and then seeing. And sometimes we believe we have to act, I believe we have to act in faith to see Jesus' miracles. It's the act of simply believing his word at first, and then he shows his power to us. And I kind of think like the Nazarenes, they were wanting him to show us power first. And then they would believe. Sometimes we're like that, aren't we? Oh, yes. And so my examples were Noah, they're famous for being told by God a flood was coming, knowing they had never seen rain according to the scriptures at that time, and then to build this big old boat, and he did it. That was like. Not even knowing what was coming forth. And imagine, I mean, the, they never even seen rain. The years of work. That's the first time the rain is recorded in, yeah, in Scripture. And so he puts all this work and effort into something, believing that God's going to show up, God's going to make it happen, even though he had never seen it for himself before. And a lot of times, yeah, we put in effort to something a little bit, but we wait on God every step of the way. The same thing with Abraham, he was told he and Sarah were going to have a child and he was going to be the father of many nations and that he was going to inherit a promised land, not told where the land was to begin with either. He was just told to go start his journey and he does and then we also know he tries to make the promise happen on his own by having a maidservant be the birth mother of his child. At the suggestion of his wife, yes. So while we get in trouble, listen to our wives. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, so maybe his faith wasn't in question there. More her faith. Well, he went along with it. He went so along with it because he got he to didn't please his stand wife. up and say, you know, I believe this is going to happen. Right. But how many times do we do the same thing? God tells us he's going to do something. And it may be far off in a time where we're wanting it to be now. We want it to happen in our time. And so we go about trying to make things happen instead of waiting patiently on the Lord to do his work because we want it now. And then also mentioned today Moses and him going, going to... Uh, Tell Pharaoh, called by God to go and tell Pharaoh over Egypt to release his people. And we know that Moses protested and gave him all kinds of excuses, and yet he finally still went and did so. And in fact, rescued the Jews from that because of God going with them. And then led them out to the promised land. And this, there are many more stories throughout the scriptures that we could look at. And, uh, hey, Mr. Jacob. <laughs> uh, many other stories of acts of faith. Hebrews 11, I believe it is, has, a, or Hebrews 12, excuse me, has a list of all the great people of faith throughout the Bible. Now, how many of us want the miracle before we will accept his word and faith? Most of us. <laughs> That's what I say. Most of us. <laughs> I know myself, you know, I can feel like God's moving me to do something, but yet I want to look into, overanalyze, wait on him to verbally tell me the next step, everything before I go, or before I do. See flashing arrows pointing away? Right, you know, it's the, what you call it, the movie. Bruce Almighty. Oh, yeah. You know, God just gave me a sign, and he passes all these various signs, you know. 
And we all want the same thing. We want to believe, but we want to see it before we believe it. Too often, I believe. And so maybe your future is only as far as the next step of faith is. Now God wants us to move in faith. And if we know what's going to happen, we know the next step, what faith is there. Maybe the Nazarenes just wanted a, a genie God and not the real God. They wanted to see the miraculous for Jesus to show himself. So we've said before, Jesus' works of the miraculous usually had a point where not just to show himself all the time. Many times they were to point to who he was to show he had the power of God. And sometimes they were just acts of compassion. And just because somebody came and had great faith, he responded to their faith in that way. But, how many miracles are there in the scriptures that Jesus did? You got a number? I got a number. I don't know. <laughs> then we could, all, we could all sit here and go from memory and, and remember. There's a lot of them, that's for sure. And a lot of them are one-on-one. -on -one. There's a few of them that are multi, yeah. multiple people. Uh, if you think about healings, there's a few less. Of course, we think, you know, the big ones, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, you know. And then you have those of him healing the centurion's son, him he healing the woman that tugged at his, the hem of his garment, and Peter's mother-in-law raising Lazarus. There's between 37 and 40 miracles that Jesus did recorded in the Gospels. I was thinking 52, I don't know why. <laughs> One for every week. <laughs> Allison said 52, that's where that come from. <laughs> well now, here in the fourth chapter of Luke, mm -hmm. uh, did many healed after Sabbath sunset, mm. said that uh, any that had, all those who had any right. that were sick with various diseases brought right. them. And he laid hands on them and every one of them and healed them. So there could have been 50. Right. Oh, yeah. I was, as far as the acts that are recorded. Oh, yeah. I mean, didn't, even they, didn't they even say that not all of them could be put down? Put down as in? Recorded. Because it'd be yeah, too many. Think it oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I believe John actually says that not all of them could be recorded yeah. in the Bible or else yeah. it would, or recorded in this gospel or else it would be too big. But yeah, so we had the individual ones written out, and then a lot of times it was that little caption, quote-unquote, that then he healed others while he was there. Did Jesus do every miracle that he could have? <laughs> well, I mean, he could have been, I was like, been probably doing not. miracles every day. That's what I was saying, yeah. Every day. Probably not, because there's a lot of people that had demons, probably. Oh, no doubt, right. <laughs> Now, I've seen with, with the church, you know, or with the synagogue he was in, was that the only demon-possessed man there, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, of course not. Of course, he, he didn't do every miracle that he possibly could have. But again, he had, and he had then and today his reasons why he may or may not have worked a miracle in each situation. But if you know he's called you to do something, to believe something, then I dare say that we need to move in faith trusting that he's going to be there to guide us. It's hard for us to do even in small things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we want to, we want him to hold our hand on every step. And as I said, it's not really faith per se. So again, imagine you're sitting in the church, captivated by the speaker, and suddenly somebody cries out, unannounced. And you can kind of imagine the scene that Jesus would have been faced with there. You know, he's up there teaching, and then in the middle of what he's saying, this demon-possessed guy yells out. I wonder what Jesus' full message was. <laughs> if he knew already beforehand this guy was going to disturb him, so he cut his message short. <laughs> he probably did. Yeah. 
Verse 33 says, In the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice. And so my thought was, I wonder if the man had been attending the synagogue regularly before this day. And he had just never been really provoked like he was with Jesus being there to cry out in need of healing or in need of exorcism. But it was the demon that It was the demon that did it, right. The demon recognized his power. Yeah. Right. And the power of he knew he was uh, threatened. Ah, oh, he may have been threatened, right. Uh, the demon said with a loud voice, let us Uh huh. Right, alone. right. We're going to get to that too, right? That was my next thing, the let us. So maybe it was Jesus' words or maybe it was his presence there that now filled, filled the spite of this place that caused the demon to scream out to yell out but nonetheless he was now provoked and was causing a ruckus and I also find it interesting that in his in the demon's response verse 34 says hi what what have you to do with us Jesus of Nazareth have you come to destroy us and then I know who you are the Holy One of God so why do you think he used the word us Well, it seems like when someone was demon possessed, it was rarely one demon. Well, apparently not. I mean, did, sometimes there was lots of things. Yeah, he's like, for my name is Legion. Mm -hmm. Right, that's like we had the Legion story, right. I don't know, you know, and it doesn't tell us, but I'm wondering if maybe he was speaking for the congregation as well. You mean other demons that were possibly there? I mean let everybody there. Oh. Let us in this place alone. Things have been going smooth and then Jesus comes up on the scene. And that might make might kind of make you think that he was a regular attendant. Right. And that's kind of what, what I was thinking too, you know. So maybe he or others with him as far as the demon goes, and you know, maybe people were just blinded to their need for Jesus or their need for God. Even though they were going to the Sabbath, religious—I mean, going to the synagogue religiously—but not really ready to fully believe or give their lives. And so that was kind of my thought. Of maybe you know, he had them in his palm. In his palm, he had them under his control. And if that's so, then what are we to learn from it? Huh? <laughs> Ain't nobody typing nothing. <laughs> what are we to learn from their response? From what if it was, what if he was speaking about the entire congregation for the us? Well, I think it goes to show that religion or ceremonies don't threaten Satan. Hmm. It's the truth. It's the real power. Right. right. And sometimes just being in the religious place, there's still no power per se in don't that make place. Any waves. Yeah. You know, it's like people say, you know, you can park a car in the garage, you don't or you can park yourself in the garage, it doesn't make you a car, you know. Being a church doesn't mean you're a Christian or a believer at all. I was saying, you know, how many people walk around saying to our preaching the gospel today, let us alone. And they don't want to hear us tell of our faith. They don't want us to preach to them. It's like that all the time in act, with, with actions. Mm -hmm. With what? With people, the way people respond to, um, it's easy to scroll past any kind of sermon or right. religious message. Yeah, it's easy to scroll past stuff. It's easy to avoid churches altogether. And it's easy for us to respond, you know, the unbeliever to respond, and that's your faith. That's not me. 
I do think we have to be careful oh, yes. that we are listening to authority. Right. You know, because, I mean, I think there are some out there that, you know, we all not listen to. Them. Right, right. Definitely. I mean, even while Jesus was still alive, there were false teachers. Right. While he was here, there's still people still preaching still the wrong here. thing, yeah. I was saying how much Satan would, would prefer that we allow the lost to remain lost, you know, to leave them alone. Now note the demon says, I know who you are, and proceeds to state that Jesus is the Holy One of God. Well, no matter the mind of the listener that was there in the synagogue that day who may have questioned, as many of us do in our choice in our churches, here the demoniac himself knew who Jesus was. He had no question, and in his knowledge he expected Jesus, in my opinion, reading this, he expected Jesus to destroy him. Because he says, What have you what have you, have you come to destroy us? And even with that. I kind of looked at it as wondering if maybe he will, you know, the demon doesn't know God's full plan. He may know who Jesus is, may not believe God's full plan, even if he knows it. And maybe he was seeing Jesus coming on the scene being an ushering in to that time where his rule and his domain was about to come to an end. what she does yeah oh yeah <laughs> I'm my dog breathing mm -hmm. uh, it could be possible that the demon himself may have thought that with Jesus on the scene this was the end for him and for the unbelievers that were there if this was so how much it speaks to the life of knowledge for the demon kind of God saving plan and his patience that we still experience today. In Jesus' words to the demon, be silent and come out of him. Well, we always try to focus just on the red letter, see what we can kind of learn. Interestingly, the, the real language used is actually be muzzled. Be muzzled. Be muzzled. Instead of just be silent, be muzzled. Be quiet. Huh? Be quiet. be quiet, yeah. Now, one commentator notes, you know, a lot of times, and we see it as well in reading about Jesus, where a lot of times he told the demons not to proclaim who he was. There's a few different occasions of that. He tells even some of the people that he heals, you know, be quiet, don't tell anybody else, because he knew the crowds and everything that was going to be gathering because of that. And he was on his mission to continue to preach the gospel. So here we see the man get exercised. Even the demon knows who Jesus is, but yet the demon himself is not saved by his knowledge of who Jesus is. He doesn't get the opportunity to experience God's grace. So the people see Jesus using his, his godly power and just using the words, be silenced and come out of it. He didn't have to touch him, didn't have to walk over to him, whisper anything to him, nothing. It was just the power of his spoken word. And the people had already said, you know, Luke records it, they noted his teaching with power and authority. And then they get to see it displayed as well. And I thought it was interesting that, you know, though the demonic are under Satan's rule and his command, here we have Jesus overruling Satan's command. And showing who has the ultimate power there in that situation. And I was saying about, you know, whenever we wrestle with sins and addictions and, and other things in our lives, the flesh, dare I say, Satan's voice, whatever in our head trying to get us to do things, we have to remember whose command is stronger. 
who's the more powerful. You know, focus on God's words in our in our minds and our ears versus listening to our flesh or to our sinful nature, you know. And then the word today ends with the demon throwing the man down and coming out of him and no harm was done to the man. And the people being amazed at the, at the power of Jesus over this demon, noting that he commands even the unclean spirits. So Jesus not only casts out the demon, but also protects the man from being hurt. Is there anything we can learn from that? Or any significance to it? <laughs> I think it means like he he took their power so they couldn't hurt him. Mm. Took the power of the demon so he couldn't hurt him. It's a good thought. Not far from what I was thinking, I kind of went back to the demons are you here to destroy us comment. This question of Jesus. So they went quietly instead of... And so he cast out the demon, but the man was left safe. And he removed his evil, but renewed the man. That brought him to new life. I thought it was pretty neat. Well, look at him. Well, Jesus proved he was capable of showing grace to the man that had been demon-possessed and that he didn't hurt the man or allow the the demon or the evil to hurt him and what come to mind for me a lot of times you know, we look around us and we see the evil deeds of people sometimes we wrestle with our own fleshly evil deeds or desires and Paul writes in Ephesians for us to remember we do not wrestle against flesh and blood in other words, it is the powers and principalities, and he says against the rulers, against authorities, cosmic powers of this darkness age, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And what is it that causes us humans to do wrong? It is our sin nature. It is our flesh. It is being at the wiles, quote-unquote, of Satan and our flesh and the desire to do the wrong thing too often. Now, we still sin afterwards. Oh right? yes, yes. But I don't think that I mean, our desire certainly isn't there to sin. Yeah, and we have a weapon to yeah. use against right. it. Right. Yeah, we, we, we're never going to be sinless and that's why I always point to us as well saying that even the, the evil desire that we sometimes may wrestle with or the the rebellious nature that sometimes we even as saved people wrestle with is still fighting the flesh, fighting, fighting the sinful nature, and in some cases fighting Satan or his demons himself. And I think that whenever we look around and we see, especially today with everything going on around us, all the evil and all the destruction or all the hate and all the violence and all that good stuff, you know, too often we want to lash out at the people. But yet we have to remember it is a spiritual battle that we are in and that these people that are being used by, dare I say, forces of evil to cause hate, division, violence, and all that good stuff good stuff and I think we have to remember that in our approach and in our personal reaction to things and while some things require consequences and punishment here by authorities or by you know, our laws we as Christians ought to be the first as well to offer love and grace and seek for them to experience 
love, and grace that Christ offers. Instead of us casting our hate and our judgment and all of that on them, as sometimes we can do, which we, which even that comes from us and our, dare I say, sin nature, our anger side of, of us, wanting to exact our own revenge sometimes. Now that Jesus with the demon and the person, he separated the demon from the person. He cast out the demon, but he took care of the person. Now they let us seek to do the same, see people as they are in Christ and not as their actions show them to be. Remember they're being used by darkness, but the light of Christ can set them free. Anything anybody wants to add to that? Thank you, covered it pretty good. We're only 40 minutes tonight. <laughs> Everybody gets off luck. Allison did talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, prayers. I have an Indian friend that asked me to remember his. They live in a, his parents live in a rough area. And he says, uh, a mom and grandma pray for their protection, their home from thieves and drunk people around them. And says someone came and banged on their, their side gate this very night, you know, it's nighttime there. And then also it's raining there, storming. They have no power, the heat and all that good stuff. And so he's always concerned about his parents. And, family so I have a request uh, a young college student that has severe 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 allergies mm. and uh, having trouble surviving uh, without being sick right she, she just needs to find a place that she can live without being sick with allergies. That's rough. Almost like you need to live in a bubble. Almost. Yeah. Of course, got friends with addictions. Mm-hmm. Yep, all kind of addictions going on. Friends who seemingly outside of the fold. Mm-hmm. And I'm not the judge. Right, right, yeah, I get you there. We all have friends that aren't living claim, but don't live it. I didn't get that. Could nobody, you try again? Nobody talking to you, Siri. She wanted to speak in last week's sermon, too. Go away. Well, let us pray. Father God, once again, we give you thanks and praise for this time together for your word, for the example of Jesus, for his red letters, where we can learn from what it was he said, things that he did, and even looking at the things that the people around him said and how they responded. Father, we pray that your word penetrates hearts and minds as it goes out from here. People click on this later on. We just pray that you open hearts and minds to your word of grace. Father, we pray for the, the friend with the allergies and the severe reactions with that. And we just pray that you help them to experience freedom, help them to find some comfort, some relief, a safe place. Father, we pray for my friend Avi and his parents and grandparents and the neighborhood they're living in. We pray that you just surround them. I know that, you know, the Christian people there are persecuted. And that could be why these things are happening to them. Father, well, we pray for their protection. Pray for Avi and his family and their peace. Pray for restoration of power and protection from rain and storms. Father, well, we do pray for the various anxieties that are out there right now. Various mental health issues that are out and around us right now, especially dealing with the coronavirus stuff. Loss of jobs, Father. We pray for our economy. We pray for work. Pray for cures 
removal of the sickness is going on. Uh, we pray for those that are struggling with addiction around us. Father, for we know that you are the one that can heal, that can relieve, and that can free people from the demon of addiction. Father, we pray for peace. For your love to rule within your people, within us, for an end to the division that our world just seems to continue to suffer with. Father, help us be that light that goes into dark places. That light that could possibly, like you, like Jesus provoked in the synagogue there, may we in our words and our actions and our way that we live our lives provoke others to an interest in who Jesus is so that they can then make that step of faith into believing and walking and trusting in him daily. And Father, I pray that you help us to do the same, to walk in faith, to be willing to take those steps even when we don't know what it is we're stepping into, so that we can move in faith and then know that you will be there with us, for you never leave and forsake us. We give you thanks for your love, for your peace, for your comfort, and most of all for your salvation. May you be glorified by all that we do, for it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank y'all for joining us. I'll see Jacob tomorrow and have fun, Caleb. <laughs> bye. 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 Everybody bye. says bye. <laughs>